Good evening, thank you for uh, the opportunity to come and share my story in front of everybody uh, this evening. Um, I'm a world champion in swimming, I'm a Paralympic champion in swimming, and I've actually, as you heard earlier tonight about September being uh, Terry Fox in a few weeks, uh, I lost part of my right leg to cancer, but the one thing I'm most proud of these days is, as I title my speech, the journey to normal. And I'm sure we each have our own kind of journey towards normal, but uh, before I talk to you about my normal, I'd like to bring you back to where it all began for me uh, to give you a little bit more perspective. I was born in January 16th, 1974 in Moncton, New Brunswick, and I had a twin brother. His name is Brett. So for the first uh, six years of our life, we were traveling around. We moved around from New Brunswick to Nova Scotia, finally settling uh, for the early elementary years in North Sydney, uh, Nova Scotia. One time we were downstairs and we were playing around and we were jumping from sofa to sofa. And it was like one, two, three, and I'd fly from, six years old, fly from one sofa to the other and land softly. One, two, three, and I would do it again, and Brett would do it again, back and forth, and on and on we played. And we did this many, many times, until one time it was one, two, three, floor, and I'm down on the floor, and I'm in pain. And my parents, who were entertaining friends, came downstairs and were looking at me, and they knew something was terribly wrong. So they took me to the hospital. At the hospital, doctors did some tests and decided that in order to help me, they had to transfer me to Halifax, to the Isaac Walton Killam Hospital, where more tests were done. And it was diagnosed that I had osteogenic sarcoma, which in layman's terms means bone cancer. So the doctors decided to remove part of my right leg. And um, I thought that, you know, obviously this was bad, but they gave me a 35% chance of survival. Because of this chance of survival, obviously the diagnosis was, was bleak, but I was able to make it through. And then again, on my birthday, January 16th, 1982, I was eight years old, and I thought I had one treatment left. They came into the hospital room, and they told myself and my parents that the cancer had gone to my lung. 35% chance again, trying to beat it, and I was able to overcome that, and I was able to walk out of the hospital. Now, it didn't seem fair that my brother never had cancer and the fact that I had it twice. So I'm having cancer twice and he's not having cancer at all. The only thing that I kind of hold on to from those early years that I am so much better looking than he is. <laughs> you should see him, seriously. <laughs> so anyways, I get out of the hospital and uh, I'm this kid, six years old, eight years old in North Sydney, Nova Scotia. There's nobody around me that have a disability. So I was unique, I was different. I was far from normal. My parents took, took us to uh, Florida that year uh, just to get our minds off things, relax, enjoy, be a kid. And I'd walk around with sweatpants because I didn't want people to see my artificial leg. But then it would get hot and I'd have rashes and it was, uh, it was a hard time uh, for me trying to adjust to life as, as an amputee. So I'm gonna show you my leg now. This is what I walk around with. So th this, um, this tattoo I got on my leg, I, I got it in uh, 1996 because I wanted people to know when I was at my swimming competitions that I was a proud Canadian. And when I go to schools and I tell the school kids, don't get a tattoo. I got a tattoo on my leg and it really hurt. <laughs> Sometimes the kids don't get that. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, 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 I had this leg and over the course of the next few years, I, I played different sports with, with Brett and did all kinds of other things with him and a lot of my other friends. Until one time I found competitive swimming and I was 15 years old and the call came March 1989. My aunt knew the national coach of the time, so he got me involved in swimming. He's like, hey Andrew, you, you, you potentially you know, could join the team and maybe go to national championships and who knows past that. So I said, all right, I'll try it. So I went, when I went to the pool, one of the amazing things happened in my early life was I felt a, a, like it was home for me. The water was home for me. I didn't care if people saw me with one leg hopping around, doing all those types of things. So I swam back and forth and I did a ton of the work and I was able to go to my first national championships. The national championships that year in Richmond, British Columbia. So my, my parents all packed up, me, mom and dad and Brett, we went to Richmond. 
And this was only in July of 89 after only hadn't swum for the first few months. And I won three bronze medals to take back to Nova Scotia. And it was an amazing accomplishment. But I'm going to give you a secret. You can share a secret. Share with hands if you can share a secret. You guys aren't sharing my secret? Okay. There was three people in the race. No joke. So there's three people in the race. I finished third, but I had a bronze medal, and it was exciting. And I went back home, and I trained for another year until I finally moved to the Halifax area and started training with a team called the Dartmouth Crusaders. So I'm training, and I, and I went to world championships that year. And have you ever wanted to accomplish something? And ask yourself this. Have you ever wanted to accomplish something so bad that you'll do whatever it took to accomplish that goal? And I did, and I see a lot of people nodding, and I did want to accomplish something so bad, and that was I wanted to be world champion one year, one day. 1990 World Championships, I was 16th in the, one of the races, I was 10th in the 400 meter freestyle, and I was disqualified in one of the relays. They didn't like me too much. So I went home, and on the plane ride on the way home, I said to myself, Andrew, one day you will be a world champion that positive self-talk that a lot of leaders, as I'm, as I'm hearing during time, tell me, those people, they tell themselves something. And I told myself I was gonna be world champion. So I went home, and I went home and I started really training, really getting focused on this goal because I saw people at this competition with one arm, with one leg, no arms, no legs, blind, and I knew I can compete, and I can compete really well with these types of people. Because some people dream of success, while others wake up and work at it. And I was one of those people who woke up and work at it. So when I went, to the, went home and got to the pool, we were doing swim workouts, six, 7,000 kilometers, getting up at 20 to 5 in the morning, getting in the pool, cold pool, in the winter at 5.30 in the morning to swim to 7. And, and I wanted to stop. There's sometimes, you know, in life, you can each ask yourself this question. When I did this, did I want to stop? Did it get hard? And the answer is undoubtedly a lot of times it's yes, I want to stop. But I didn't stop. And every time I didn't stop, I got a little more momentum, a little more pride that I was on the right track, and way more encouragement that the goal that I had in mind, the world championship goal, was a reality. So after that happened, I went over a couple years later to Barcelona, Barcelona, Spain, the 1992 Paralympics, my first Paralympic Games. Paralympics these days are, 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 are big. They were big back then, but every year they keep getting bigger and bigger. The athletes with disability, the Parapans that were in Toronto not too long ago. My first race was a 400 meter freestyle, the same race that I was 10th at World Championships. I was told on the way, ho on the way over in the plane by the chef de mission, Andrew, if you win a, a medal, any medal, we're gonna give you business class on the way home. It was kind of this running joke that for people who, I was in the crowd of not supposed to medal. Um, so anyways, seriously, you know, kind of like out shot, outside shot, if not even like close, in heats, which is the morning swim, my best time was four minutes and 58 seconds going into the race. I raced against the world record holder. I went four minutes and 46 seconds and broke the Canadian record. Thank you. Oh, it, 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 it's going to get better. So, so anyways, um, I did the 446, and I was second going into finals that night. There was three swimmers that were supposed to win the medals, Iceland, Norway, and Germany. Everybody thought so. They'd won the medals two years earlier at World Championships. Everybody else was swimming for essentially fourth to eighth spot. So we got it to the top of the water, ready to dive in, and I was feeling really excited because Mark Tewksbury had won a gold medal for Canada two weeks earlier at the, at the test event for the Paralympics, you know, those Olympics, they called them. So anyways, I dove into this water, and at the 200 meter mark, I was in second place. And the 300 meter mark, I was also, sorry, I was in fourth place at the 200 meter mark. I was in fourth place at the 300 meter mark. And I told myself something. And I would, I would encourage each and every one of you to tell yourself this if you're maybe in a tough spot. And at the 300 meter mark with 100 meters left to go, I told myself, Andrew, allow yourself to be great. And that took away all the negative thought, all the doubting that I might have that what happens if I die the last 10 meters, so what? It's just a matter, whoever wins is the one that deals with the pain the best. So I did that, and when I touched the wall, Norway was four minutes and 41 seconds. Iceland was four minutes and 42 seconds. And I touched the wall in third for a bronze medal, four minutes and 43 seconds, and a Canadian record, 
and still I'm looking for business class. Fast forward many years later, after many competitions and trying to be the best and trying to get to the world championships, I finally was at world championships in 1998. In 1998 was one of those years where I was going in ranked first in the 100 meter butterfly. Anybody like butterfly? I got some. Not an easy stroke. But anyways, at the 50 meter mark after the race was for finals, I was leading the race and I could see the clock. And normally when I'm leading at the 50 and the 100s, I'm not caught. And this race was no different. So when I finally got to the end of the race, I looked up at the scoreboard and I'd won the gold medal. After all those years, all those things, trying to make sure I was in the water in the morning. And people would say to me, Andrew, have you sacrificed? What have you sacrificed in your career? And I would say, I did not sacrifice a thing because I was doing something I loved. I was doing something I loved in order to travel and learn things and grow as a person. So I would say that I invested my time in order to be the best I possibly could be. And as a result of being there and being in that competition, I'm lucky to have the medal with me, <laughs> which it's, thank you. It's engraved and it's really nice. And um, October 14th, and I have that word finally engraved in the back of the medal because, because of everything that I did for that particular race. media so <laughs> anyways um two years later i got to the paralympics and paralympics obviously were again elite uh competition um i won the bronze medal in the, in the 100 meter butterfly i wasn't able to uh, get that gold medal but on the last night our relay team there was two events left and we had three other guys on my team all gold medalists and then so all these gold medalists on my team but i was trying to be the leader of the team i was trying to take our leadership levels, because somebody obviously has to lead, and I was trying to be that guy. And when we dove in the water, and when we finally won, and my teammate Benoit had touched the, the, the block to, to end the race, we not only set a, won the gold medal, but we also won a world record, or we had a world record. So something like that was just something else. So we'll share that one too. <laughs> they just keep getting bigger. Anyways, so I also like to say my point is about, about leadership and leadership styles. And I'm not going to talk too much about it, but leadership styles is we each have to have a situation in our companies where you want to take leadership to the max. If you're coping um, with, with stress or you, you're, you change or teamwork or organizational structure or whatever the case may be, it doesn't mean to be a leader that you have to have a business card that says you're the manager or you're a director or you're they're that high in the organizational chart. You need somebody that cares and you need others to follow that person in order to lead, in order to be the best that you possibly can be. So no matter where your situation is, no matter what your company is, no matter what you're doing, each and everybody in here can lead. You can lead because if you care and others will follow you in your dream and your vision, you can accomplish anything that you wanna do in that case. So. The other thing is, obviously, I talked about before when I started, the world champion, Commonwealth Games champion, Paralympic champion, the cancer survivor, and so on and so forth. And now we get back to the point, the journey towards normal. Up until I started, I worked for a baseball team you may have heard of, the Blue Jays. And it's been fun. It's, I've been there for 12 years, and I can honestly say this is the first year that it's been obviously amazing, um, extra amazing. <laughs> Don't know why. But despite that, um, I was, everything that I did up until that point in my life was, I've got one leg, I'm a swimmer. It was all based on losing my leg when I was six or losing my lung, all of those decisions. And then I'm working full time. And then while I'm working full time, I went to a competition, same like as you just saw in Toronto, the Parapans, but these are in Rio de Janeiro. And I met my wife at the Parapans, and now we have a daughter. So I'm a businessman with the Jays. I'm a husband, I'm a father, and a lot of the things, a lot of the things that I'm doing are based on being more normal. Now, gone is the kid of worrying about what everybody thought about me because I didn't want somebody to see my leg. Now are the days where I'm trying to make decisions for us as a family, or me as a dad, or me as a sales guy trying to 
you know, help get our team into the playoffs and make our fans happy and all the things that go into that. So for me, that part of normal is a really great accomplishment for me because I don't have to think about my leg as much as I otherwise would have. One of my favorite movies, and you may have heard it, is the movie called uh, Rudy. Who's heard of the movie Rudy? So Rudy tells a story of the, this character, Sean, he's played by Sean Astin, Rudy Rudiger, and he's not the smartest, and he's not the brightest, and he's not the fastest, and he doesn't really have a lot of athletic ability, but he really, really, really wanted to play for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish football team. And he would practice and practice and practice, but he never really got to play until one moment he was put in on the final play of his senior year. And what did he do? He sacked the quarterback because he was a defensive player. So the point is, if you were given that chance to sack your quarterback or do whatever you think may need in terms of walking through that door, would you be ready for it? Would you be ready to be called upon to say, you know what, you can accomplish something special? There are many people that'll tell you that things are impossible. Air travel once was probably considered impossible. A black president of the United States considered impossible way back when, if you considered how far we've come. And many other things, putting a man on the moon, impossible. But there's many people that'll tell you that you can't do something because they're small-minded people who want to drag you down instead of help push you up. I remember when I got my job with the Blue Jays, and not to pick on my dad a little bit here, but I called home and I was so excited. I said, Dad, I got a job with the Blue Jays. This is great. I was in Calgary and I just came back from World Championships having won another gold medal at the World Championships in 2002. I'll just throw that in there. And, and, but I was, I was you know, in debt, and I wanted something different, and I really liked sports. And he said, Andrew, you have a master's degree. You shouldn't be, you know, how much are you making? $32,000 in Toronto. Oh, you can't live off of that. But I did it anyways. And I took that door, and I opened it. And it's gone really, really well for me because I've enjoyed my time in Toronto over the course of the last 12 years and being able to do that. The other, the other story I'd like to share is the, the power of the tiny frog. I don't know if you've ever heard a story or sort of some sort of va variation of this story about this frog, but I'm going to call him an honor tonight, Tuny Frog. And they were racing tonight, going up this mountain to this, this antenna, and it was the top of the mountain. It was really difficult. So all everybody, they're, they're running, they're going up to the top of this mountain, and People can like, nobody's ever done, nobody's ever won this race before. So there, there's a lot of negative people. No, there's no way you're not going to win this race. And it starts raining. And so the, the naysayers, the negative people, they, they, they were basically shouting it out loud until there's only like a couple of frogs left because everybody had listened to the, the crowd in the room that you can't accomplish the top of this race until one tiny frog had finished the race when nobody thought he would, despite people saying, you're not going to do it, it's too far, it's too steep, it's, you know, fill in the blank. So why do you think after so many years of not being able to win this race, this one frog was able to accomplish what no other tiny little frog had accomplished? What do you think? He was deaf. The frog was deaf. So the moral of the story is... Don't listen to people who are going to try to bring you down. Listen to people who are going to give you positive reinforcements and energy because those are the people that you want on your side. Those are certainly the people. So in closing, I'd just like to say this. Martin Luther King once said, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great. So each and every one of you in here can certainly be great in whatever you choose to do because you don't have to conquer the world. It's a big place out there. In my mind, you just have to conquer your world. And if you conquer your world and you do what you need to do, whether it's being a parent or volunteer or in your job or whatever, I think you'd be fulfilled with whatever you have to choose um, going forward. Thank you very much.